Cultural Perspectives as a company has been around for 20 years. Fantastic. 20 years. And what I do is I do stuff. I came out of government, so I've worked in different jurisdictions in government, but my big expertise was understanding about ethnic communities and migration, migration policy. And I'd worked in a lot of different domains. So I'd worked in um, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the New South Wales Ethnic Affairs Commission, the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. So I understood those things pretty well. So then going into the private sector, it was about was there interest either from government or private companies in terms of wanting to be able to relate to ethnic communities and my view was I actually had the skills to make that connection. Fantastic. Mm. And so like can you would can people be convinced to put F, like money value on culture or it's it's a it's a good question. There, there are two imperatives. Well, there's a government imperative which is about the, the policy setting and whether it's seen to be something that needs to be done. And one of the big problems we've had in the recent past is that there wasn't that, that imperative and that in fact in terms of society there was less value placed on culture and far more on gender or Aboriginality or remoteness or even disability where they were seen as legitimate uh, subgroups but multiculturalism per se or ethnic communities were not. And I think that's been a really interesting discourse at a political level because what you've had is you've actually had people doing things and governments doing things because they feel it's the right thing to do but without really believing it. So they'll do a series of translations but not really caring whether they're going to be read or not. So there's activity without necessarily meaning or substance. As in the public sector, the private sector, the, and the reality is around the private sector, is they will engage with this area if indeed they can make a return. So, and that, that ability to see um, activities or business in terms of what is a political imperative and then for uh, my business for government, a political imperative, my business for business as an economic imperative. Well, FECA sits as a non-government organisation or part of civil society. So it's a federated structure which um, is supported by or represents state-based structures. So in New South Wales, there's New South Wales Ethnic Communities Council. There's one in every state. Then there are a range of regional ethnic communities councils in New South Wales. They are in Wagga, in Wollongong, in Newcastle. Um, and they are attempts to bring ethnic communities together to create a base on which to advocate for their common needs. Not individuals, so a Chinese community will, will do what they need to do, Italian, Arabic, uh, Arabic general or pan-Arabic or ethnic, or, you know, country specific like Lebanese or Egyptian. They can all exist, but there is real value at times when um, the, their common issues are brought together and the ethnic communities councils have been ways of doing that. So the ethnic communities councils then every two years elect an executive at a federal level and for the last two terms I've been the chairperson. So the roles I have there are quite specific. It is to provide a, an advocacy voice for ethnic communities. So when we're talking about ageing, um, I'm, I'm charged with talking about the, the, the needs of people as they're ageing in Australia and how our systems of aged care need to not only change to meet their needs but need to work with them so that what's designed will actually be relevant to them and, and useful to them. And it's the same in many, many other areas. The other thing that FECA does is probably more than any other organisation, we engage in the debate around cultural diversity and multiculturalism in Australia. Academic institutions do that really well, specific researchers who look for the evidence base, but it's our role um, to when there is a, you know, a, a national debate, we have to actually be part of that debate both articulate, evidence and, and referred to be able to say this is the reality, this is uh, the contribution because unfortunately in terms of our political environments right now we have almost denied, denied the contribution of other migrant groups and we are perpetuating this notion that the English cultural group is indigenous to Australia. How do you reconcile both, like, you know, your non-profit uh, hmm. and then your commercial? And It's a really good question. I think the issue is you've got to be careful once when you make money from a sector that you're not perpetrate, or that you're not, um, what's the word, maintaining or perpetuating the, the disadvantage. So people come to us because they want to know what the community feel about personal health issues or uh, a, 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 a cancer screening program or whether they'll buy uh, into a mausoleum or anything. We can be asked any research question at all and we, because we've got a methodology works, go into ethnic communities and seek that information. And we do it through either 
uh, researchers who have the language or um, methods which can accommodate their, their linguistic positioning. So in that, invariably, you're actually exploiting that diversity. If there is a value in what you're doing is because that diversity exists. And I think that that does create then some responsibilities if we are doing it, what will support both our longer term business as well as reconcile what we're doing in terms of then giving back. So right through my history in, in private company, in private work over 20 years, I've had a parallel community role um, at a number of different levels. So at the moment it's FECA, as a big one because it yeah. takes up a lot of my time. I also chair the National, um, uh, National Call Dementia Network for mm -hmm. the Alzheimer's Australia. So it, it creates a perspective around dementia and Alzheimer's from a call perspective. I chair a think tank for the National Prescribing Service. I do some stuff for SBS. And at a ministerial level, I, I advise the Minister for Aboriginal Health, Warren Snowden, on men's health issues. Now, all of those things are voluntary. And before that, though, uh, for many years, I've been on a number of different committees, but the one I spent a lot of time on was with the Italian community, and I've always been part of that community, working in small organisations as a volunteer, and then I did 22 years um, in Coasset in uh, New South Wales and in that role I developed a welfare program, uh, a school, a bilingual school, a range of, of other programs that the organisation has developed on, on not just on behalf of the community but to meet the community's changing needs. So I would go to a meeting of the Italian community and then I would be asked to comment on what Italian community's needs might be in terms of a product area or Yes. So the two have worked in well, as long as they're done respectfully. So I tell everyone in my community work what I do, so there's no sense that I'm exploiting for, for personal gain. And at the same time, the paid work I do has a far greater sense of validity because you're not just doing it from books, you're doing it from real people, real experiences. And especially in terms of the linkage role, uh, I'm able to say, uh, yes, if you want to speak to this group, here is a person and I'll set it up and we'll go out and speak them together. It's, a, it's an interesting position. I mean, the notion of a democracy and a majority makes sense if indeed you buy into uh, English white being the majority. The reality is over two generations, I don't think, I, I know, that less than half of the population can claim to have all four grandparents born in, in English-speaking countries. Not just overseas, but in English-speaking countries. So the notion of what is majority and minority, I think, needs to be reconsidered. There is, though, a legitimacy in terms of the, the role that the first of the migrant groups, in terms of the, the English, with the multiplicity of ethnicities, which were also on the first fleet and, and subsequent to that, the extent to which they created the, the social and, and legal infrastructure, then coming out of a specific tradition, that tends to have the main state. Liberal democracy, rule of law, uh, our, home, our own court system and a whole range of other issues and as well even without a, a Bill of Rights that notion of individuals under a Western democracy have individual rights. So if that's the prevailing political structure which then started what is then the, 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 not the migrant Australia if you like or the non-indigenous Australia then the reality is that the infrastructure exists and the infrastructure will then determine rate of change. The interesting thing is, and certainly it was a response to notions of Sharia law over the last couple of years, the abhorrence of this notion that they're going to take us over or we're going to, is the reality that our legal processes and structures and even our laws change over time. What was seen as legal years ago, the public, the public punishing of, of a man of, against a woman in public was something that you would question whether it was in or outside the law. Right now it's abhorrent and it's totally outside the law. But the sense is the law's actually changed around community imports, around community standards as they've developed around people. Right now, you'd probably find, and this is interesting in terms of our current issues around racism on public transport, that if someone smoked on a bus, they'd probably get more of a negative response than if someone's actually being racist to someone else. What is it about our society that we've actually created? So the issue around that is that invariably there needs to be a connection between people and its institutions and so what has happened over time is those institutions have actually changed to accommodate people but the rate of change is quite small and it becomes very very natural. So in that sense I think if there is a sense of a ruling group it is those who actually set the system up and therefore are the rule keepers 
but over time those rules will modify and change. But do you think that, I mean, this is a big question, I mean, uh, probably we don't have the answer for it, but do you think that that could mean that the constitution needs to kind of be modified and whether, whether that the fact that there's a white majority in parliament at the moment that does not reflect the Australian majority, whether would that mean that the constitution was written in such a way that it is like that? Is it an issue at the level of constitution or is it a... Yeah, well I think the constitution set the rules and the mechanism to change the rules is very difficult to achieve. So not only do you have to have a majority of the vote, but you have to have the majority of the vote in a majority of states. And there have been a number of referendum questions which have attempted to change the constitution which have not been successful. So this is a real issue for us. The real issue is under our constitution, written, which is now 114 years ago, in, in trying to interpret a world that it saw, which was very much potentially against migrants of a certain type, as well as wanting to protect the states, is still the instrument which we are now baffled with. Why is it that a state like Tasmania will have as many rights and as much representation as one local government area in Sydney, like Blacktown? So that discussion is a really interesting one. So in terms of that, then you have to then resign yourself that any system which is built on a set of rules and creates the rules by which those rules can be changed, in this case a referendum and the issues around the referendum, will be very hard to change over time. So if we are going to get change, it has to be significant and overall change, such as Aborigines being given the right to be, uh, be measured in the census in 1967. Fundamental huge change. And that's, we all, it's almost like the, the threshold before we get to change has to be a far higher one than what would otherwise be the case. So that system we have, short of a revolution, which is clearly not what I'm advocating, will not change unless the community per se changes to create that change. Is there something in the air? No, no, I don't see it. And I see, uh, I think the reality as well is that while there is some, the, some disjunction between groups who have come to Australia and whether mm. the, the law reflects them or, or meets their needs, there is a fundamental sense that uh, it does. The, the country is one that does provide opportunities, that does allow social mobility, that isn't as caught up in either um, class or, 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 or influence. Or So we have many, many migrant stories of people who have actually been quite happy with that. The only issue will be for us in the long term is that's all very good when it's a positive model. What is then the situation if the model isn't positive, if we are, are not getting social mobility, social inclusion over time. So now everyone's reacted really poorly to the last Scanlon study in indicating that third generation kids are less, uh, feeling less that they're part of a broader society. What does that mean? And then often all those questions about potential radicalisation and homegrown terrorism and, 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 and that starts to get fed. So then there's a reality is if indeed we're not going to have societies per se changing things because of the nature of the change and the mechanisms of the change, what are the, the almost the, the measures we need to identify where there is a potential for social dislocation and how do we react to it? My view is a fundamental one. I believe that people who feel respected are far more happy to respect and contribute than those who feel attacked or, or, or vilified. It's a fundamental one for me. Now I think there's a fundamental question that, that we need as Australians to ask ourselves and it came from some work I did in 1988 with the Office of Multicultural Affairs trying to define a multicultural policy and one of the questions we asked a lot of people was do you feel Australian? So that sense of connection, identity, uh, belonging. One man from a Turkish background, I mention it because he used it in his response, says I love Australia, I want to be here but I will feel Australian when other people stop identifying me as Turkish. And I thought that was a really, it was so simple, but it really made sense. So it's a sense that you can't deny the fact that he would look from a certain area around the, you know, the Mediterranean in terms of his physiology. But what he was suggesting is, have we so led with ethnicity that by the perpetuation of ethnicity as difference, that we don't actually legitimise people feeling that they're Australian? Mm -hmm. So it's about saying, you, regardless of your background, you are here in this space, we share this space. Everyone's got a history. So, but are we part of Australia? Yes. And I think that's going to be the issue into the future. Uh, it's an interesting position because the reality about online and offline from my position as someone in advocacy has created a whole range of opportunities. Like, the, the, it works like this for me in terms of, of media use. As FECA, as Chair of FECA, I'm obviously come, people come to me, but they'll come to me from, from SBS 
on any story to get a, a ethnic community perspective. They'll come to me uh, from the ABC when there's something of interest or something challenging. So when um, uh, Theresa Gambaro, the uh, opposition spokesperson on multiculturalism, stated that uh, school-based migrants needed to be taught how to cue and how to use deodorant, that became very topical. And it was interesting that the ABC gave it a lot of attention. The mainstream media or the commercial media only want to touch this where there is a boat or a, a, a criminal ring or and so the the reality is getting getting a message through has been very very difficult so we tend to pitch our messages at various areas so I know doing the SBS and the ABC stuff is important because it doesn't get to the overall population but it gets to the the people who are in government who are making decisions and actually puts you into their sphere okay so that's really important but over, overall, you are chasing it. So you could send out releases and waiting for the phone call. Social media has created something very, very different. And that is that ability to actually then create your own networks. And I'm very much moving that through. And I'm advocating it in our own organisation. The moment we're developing a, an aged care network across Australia, it's an online environment. So we've got a conduit to, well, at the moment, there's over 100 organisations, but I'd like it to be many, many more. So when the government has something to say about aged care or ageing, we can, we can actually distribute that information in the same way, then we can use that network to come back. So in short, while it's not yet online and it's still structural, there are many opportunities I see in the future where we will be able to create capacity in online environments. And from a personal perspective, the beauty for me is in terms of then the way that social media works, is that for someone who was scrapping around to try to get any attention in media generally, I now can tweet, I can um, post, I can use Facebook, I can use LinkedIn, I can use any of those tools. And my feeling is that then the ability to get a message to many people of like-mindedness is really important. So I haven't seen the results of it yet. I see it as pretty much rudimentary. I obviously I see the get-ups and the um, campaign.coms in terms of what they've been able to achieve, but they have achieved that outside of what is my domain, the ethnic communities. We are yet to achieve that uh, in ethnic communities. That's good. It's, the beautiful thing about that question is that it doesn't actually ask the question, how capable are you of doing either of those things? Okay. So if I'm to drop my culture, uh, or my language, it presupposes that I actually can speak English. It presupposes that if I can't, that I can learn quickly. Um, the bulk of the migration out of Italy in the 1950s and 60s was agrarian. People with primary school education, their linguistic ability in Italian is questionable. Their literacy in Italian is low. Therefore, their ability to be able to, to learn another language at a functioning level of literacy is questionable. So the first question is, what are then the capacities of people? And then I, I, and I think that's really interesting because some people don't not develop the skills in Australia because they don't want to, it's because they can't. They simply can't. So right now we have an age demographic where the older the age group, the less they're actually speaking English. And I'm talking about the post-war migration period. So that's one issue. The second issue is, and I think it's really important to understand it, is what is the capacity of the, the society to allow people to integrate more readily? So the reality is, for many people, that they are far less competitive in the labour market. Even though we now bring out people who, who are skilled, skilled migrants, have a whole program of skilled migration, we don't have any measure which, which guarantees that bringing in those skills will actually manifest in people working in their skilled environment. So we have this whole issue in terms of what is the capacity of us to actually not just absorb but actually meet the needs of people. If we can't meet the needs of people, then the invariable response is that they pull out of the system. So right now I can claim quite categorically that at least a third, 30% of all small businesses are indeed ethnic small businesses. And that's all small business because, because they are far more likely to see um, uh, an opportunity in terms of developing services, products that meet their own community needs. We, we've created micro economies. So it's not just a singular relationship, I go in and I change or I go in and I don't. I go in and I change to the extent that I can. I'm able to change to the extent to which I'm supported to, to change. Many of the migrants in the post-war period were not offered English language. So we didn't have the ESL programs, the AMEP, the AMESs of that time. We didn't actually equip them because we didn't want them to be speaking English. We wanted them to work in the factories. And the more that they worked in the factories and in the mines and in the construction projects and the infrastructure projects, 
the more we got the benefit from them. Now we turn around and say, but they, yeah, they've been here 30, 40 years and they haven't learned English. They've chosen not to, and you have to say, no, that's it's too simple. Every situation is considered in its merits, and it's far more complex than a simple letting go or picking up. Cool. Well, uh, it's what I would like to work to attain. Um, because the question for me is, it's, it's interesting when you see social phenomena. So if we were to have, this is, we're, in, we're having this discussion in the middle of Leichhardt, during a World Cup when Italy plays, there will be 20,000 kids on that street. Invariably, they will be not the children of migrants, but children of the children of migrants. What is it about their identification around that as something which is really positive? Then you do have to question then, have we actually not had the level of change in our institutional representation to actually show people that indeed this is their place? So we do look at our political structures and there are a lot of Southern Europeans in those political structures, but the Chinese and the other Asian ethnicities, the Middle Eastern ethnicities, the South American ethnicities, the African ethnicities, they're not there. So part of it is, are we going back on our third generation almost to a sense of ethnic identity because the community per se or the society per se has not accepted us. And I think that's an interesting question because these kids are English speaking, they're educated, they, are, they have so many opportunities, they have the material wealth of successful migration. What is it about identity that, that you would lose them in terms of this international environment, even when Italy were playing Australia? It's one that I'd, I'd look at historically because if you actually look at the African community and, and their family structure, there is a lot of this location in families and a lot of families coming here as refugees where there are kids with single parent, kids with no parents. And I could say the same for the Romanians before them, the Vietnamese before them and even the Italians before them. The reality is criminality is not linked to their ethnicity but it's linked to disadvantage. So what tends to happen where you don't have the modifying or the, the controlling factor of a tight family structure which actually acts as a protective mechanism, you actually have people who are potentially exploitable. And so that is the reality, that if, if in a society you've got kids, especially if they don't have home environments which are really strong in terms of protecting them, who with the option of either going into one direction which might be very competitive, harder for them to, to, to get work out of, to, to achieve in, and another option which is easier, a lot more money, and moves to criminality, a lot of kids have actually gone in that direction. And I'm not saying that offhand, I'm saying that from the data around the um, uh, an attached miners who came through the Vietnamese refugee migration, the, the Romanian uh, community migration after Ceausescu, and the number of young males unattached to families. Uh, more, most recently, these larger African families with a number of kids and far less potential for it to control that number in terms of parents. So um, I am fundamentally maintaining that a strong family structure is a, a mitigating factor in terms of people staying within or, or, or outside or, or what course of life they actually choose. So that is the situation. And then the reality is once those conditions change, so if I were to quote the Vietnamese crime rates in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, right now in the Vietnamese community the crime rate is almost negligible because the reality is that those, those refugee migration groups have actually settled, married, they've got their own kids and they're, they're the parents now making sure that their kids are going to school, getting an education and that and that. So to me it has to be seen in the context and has, of, of the groups themselves. I actually think that what's really important is we actually understand the rights of First Peoples. And that's an international consideration. And the fact that the whole lot, a lot of colonisations which have taken place in every jurisdiction right across the world has had to actually interact with this. The situation that our Indigenous people find themselves is extremely similar to every other Indigenous population, the Indian population in America, the Inuit in, in, in far North America, around Canada. They have disadvantage. The, the, the uh, various, various um, non-Anglo communities in, in New Zealand, they are on every measure disadvantaged. There's something around that which needs to be understood in as a worldwide phenomenon. So the issue is the positioning of First People. The second issue is that their position of disadvantage has been almost institutionalised in terms of how we see them, and they're also out of sight. So most of us actually only have certain models of, of seeing them. We see them as problems, we see them as concerns, we see them as, as, as a lower uh, life expectancy rate, higher smoking rates, higher incarceration rates. So all of the information around them is negative. So we're seeing this, this group which is actually um, not just disadvantaged but failing 
in our, in our terminology. The reality is though that there are a range of people in those communities who are doing really, really well and that there is enough change to actually warrant this consideration is that, that our, generally in society Aboriginal people can actually advance within this social construct in these institutions. So then the question is, do we take responsibility for creating a perpetual disadvantage, which I think we do have, and then the answer has got to be that in terms of w the extent to which they involve themselves or insert themselves or assimilate into Australian society has got to be from, again, their perspective. So the issue for them is not feeling that they have to uh, uh, jump through a specific hoop because that's what government policy says. It's got to start from, from us. And, and you're getting very different narratives in the Aboriginal community from those who believe that we've made the Aboriginal people too welfare dependent and want the opportunity for people to actually create their own futures. And I think there's a lot of merit in that. But the problem with that is then there is there are a whole range of social determinants then which actually determine what happens to them. Poor health, high smoking rates, um, poor, poor, poor nutrition, which are perpetuating factors. So it is about creating enough space for Aboriginal people to be able to self-determine within the parameters that they see comfortable. And I think what's far more important is up to us as a society to actually understand that they are First Peoples and as such they have a very particular positioning in our multicultural construct. So from that perspective, at FECA, in our last annual general meeting, we, we moved and accepted a constitutional change that the FECA constitution identifies Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands as the first people in Australia and respectfully says there are areas where we can collaborate but respectfully also says that we will never be able to assume that they are one cultural group within a multicultural paradigm. It is, and that I think is the, 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 the rub of this, the, the, this is what we need to be achieved need to be able to achieve respectful consideration of their rights as well as the maximising of their opportunities.